Welcome to the Health Evolution Collective. My name is Tracy McBeath, and today I have the absolute honour and pleasure to introduce you to 2020 Australian of the Year, Dr. James Mukey. Dr. Mukey has dedicated his career to the prevention of blindness and ophthalmic research as an ophthalmologist. He founded Sight for All in the year 2000, an organisation dedicated to fighting all causes of blindness with projects in Aboriginal and other Australian communities, as well as in Asia and in Africa. Uh, Dr. Mukey has been very vocal this year in terms of the problems that are associated with type 2 diabetes in Australia and the fact that sugar and refined carbohydrates are the leading cause of this disease that is entirely preventable. So today we talk a lot about that. We talk about his passion to and his his fight to get the Australian Dietary Guidelines reviewed, which has been announced that it is happening. And we talk about how we can get involved, what we can do to help make the changes that are needed to, to be made and to get the vested interests off the table in terms of that discussion. So what, it's a great conversation. There is so much in here. What an amazing man. I, from the bottom of my heart, can't thank him enough for the work that he is doing and for um, the, the passion he has to help people with their health. So I know you'll love this conversation that I had with Dr. Mukey. Please do follow along with the work that he does. And um, of course, you can reach out to him if you would like further information. What an absolute pleasure it is today to be talking to Dr. James Mukey, Australian of the Year. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tracy, and thanks for including me in your show. I'm well, very, very honoured um, and very excited to get to talk to you. The first question I have for you is, what was it actually like to be named Australian of the Year? Well, it was obviously a fabulous experience. Uh, the weekend was just amazing. And uh, to be honest, I wasn't expecting to be named Australian of the Year. I was actually surprised to be South Australian of the Year, let alone Australian of the Year. But uh, going forward towards the uh, Australia Day weekend, uh, I, I really didn't expect that they were going to award it to yet another doctor from Adelaide. So when my name was read out, it was, was a surprise, but a lovely surprise. And uh, yeah, no, it's a great honour. And particularly, um, you know, I have to acknowledge uh, Sight for All, which is the organisation that I co-founded back in 2008, which is really why I received the award, the work that Sight for All is doing, fighting blindness uh, through many of the poor communities of the world, even here in Australia and, and particularly in Aboriginal communities. So it's a uh, a great recognition for the organisation, which I feel very passionate about. Fantastic. So what, what can you talk a little bit about what that work is? Um, you know, I was going to ask you about Sight for All, why you started it, um, and what some of the, the work that you've done, you know, through that organisation? Sure. So really, as a doctor, I've been interested in public health, particularly in poor communities, really ever since uh, I graduated. In fact, I I worked in Africa as a general doctor following my internship. Um, I had a passion for surgery, and particularly microsurgery. So the thought, and I loved using my hands, so the thought of, uh, of using microsurgery to fight blindness in poor communities was something that really appealed to me. So uh, following Africa, I came back to Adelaide and, and trained as an ophthalmologist. And, uh, you know, really what's happened since that time uh, is just number of experiences that I've had that is, has just continued to fuel this passion of fighting blindness in poor communities. And and uh, when I uh, eventually came back to settle in Adelaide, I, I, uh, that was in 1998, uh, I started getting involved in a number of research and teaching uh, projects in Asia. And Asia is home to half the world's blind adults and two thirds of the world's blind children. And it was these, these experiences and, and, and several key experiences really uh, instilled in me a humanitarian spirit uh, uh, and a passion to, to want to make change in, in my profession, what I was seeing uh, in some of these countries in, in Asia. And one of the, the ones that I recall vividly, and then there were a number of experiences, but perhaps this one was, was the most powerful for me, was in 2007. And I was involved in a study in Myanmar in Southeast Asia. I was part of a, a team from Adelaide, from the Royal Adelaide Hospital. And we were undertaking a study to determine the causes of blindness amongst children in this country, which was at the time certainly one of the poorest countries of the world. And the results were, were absolutely staggering. We found that nearly half of the kids had blindness that could have been prevented or treated. But the thing that really had such a deep and profound 
impact on myself and the team was the leading cause of blindness that we found that was measles. And to be surrounded by children who were uh, blind and, and horribly disfigured from measles in schools for the blind across the country. And in fact, we also found this in, in our studies in Cambodia and, and in Laos. But to have this experience uh, when measles blindness is completely avoidable is just devastating. It was one of the most powerful uh, experiences of my clinical life and it made me realize as an eye specialist that there's so much more to blindness than, than simply cataract. Um, and it also really drove home the power of prevention in medicine. So this was a really pivotal moment for me. And uh, that was in 2007, a year later, I, I was involved in setting up uh, Site for All. And, and on the strength of that study, we were able to bring up uh, an eye specialist from a young eye specialist from Myanmar to train as a as a children's eye specialist here at the Women's and Children's Hospital in Adelaide. So he went back to his home country in 2010 as the very first paediatric ophthalmologist. We set him up in the country's first children's eye unit, uh, where he works to this day, and uh, he's now providing close to 30,000 treatments every single year, uh, which is impressive in itself, but. What I find particularly inspiring uh, the work that this young man is doing is that he, in 2015, started training his own colleagues. So he, he um, finished training a second paediatric ophthalmologist for his country, and he now trains at least two every single year. So it, it really shows you the scalability and sustainability of the work we do. And, and, and that's just one example of many examples. We've trained paediatric ophthalmologists uh, across Asia now, uh, from nine countries. And that's just one subspecialty area of the profession we've been training across all nine subspecialty areas. And we're now impacting on about a million people every single year. How amazing and completely life-changing to, to, to see that, to, you know, to have the experiences that you've had. You know, one thing that stood out there with you talk, when you were talking was you mentioned prevention. And I know uh, personally a lot of doctors who just get confronted with, the end result every day. And, you know, I know a few that have changed to move more into the prevention role of things. So it must be heartbreaking when you see things coming up that are preventable. I mean, the fact that measles, uh, you know, that, that they're getting that from measles, I find that mind blowing. But I'm also, not that this was going to be the topic at all of our discussion, but, you know, I'm also very concerned about, you know, the Western world living in this thing now of growing, you know, resistance towards immunizations when, you know, you've seen firsthand what it's like in those places where these children don't get access to this stuff. So how does that, I mean, what does that, what does that do to you, you know, to experience that? It must just profoundly change you. It does. And in fact, this was the driving force behind me setting up Site for All and, and just the continued experiences such as that one, which just drives and fuels this passion ongoing. And I would challenge any anti-vaxxer to go and sit in a school for the blind in, in, in an impoverished country and not be swayed by the, the benefits of that vaccination and herd immunity. But, uh, you know, even in those studies I mentioned, so that was... Uh, 2007, Myanmar, Cambodia 2008, even as late as 2013 in Laos, we were also finding children who are visually impaired, even blind because they'd never been tested for spectacles, quite simply because there was no one there to provide a basic service that we take for granted here in Australia. So again, you know, really powerful stuff. And this has driven an optometry training program that we've been implementing in each of those countries. But I would let me wind the clock back uh, to to my internship within 1988, and I became disillusioned uh, with medicine at that point in time. I was mainly just seeing and treating patients who had chronic diseases uh, that were predominantly self-inflicted diseases, such as um, nutritional uh, nutrition-related diseases, such as type two diabetes, and of course smoking-related diseases, which were very prominent back then. And I was frustrated by the fact that I was just simply um, alleviating symptoms, prolonging life, but actually not able to impart a cure. And, and I'm, you know, my nature is one, I love to have a project and I love to be able to complete that project with a, with a positive outcome. And so I just wasn't getting the satisfaction. And that's why I wanted to go and spend this time in, in Africa, which um, as a general doctor I mentioned before, I worked as a, as, a, as a young voluntary doctor in a little rural hospital in central Kenya. And that was really, a, again, a pivotal moment for me in my life because now for the first time, 
I was uh, treating patients who had diseases that were not self-inflicted. They were mainly infectious diseases, such as measles, uh, sorry, such as uh, such as malaria. And so I love the fact that I could now cure people, and that was really something very powerful for me. And I mentioned before that I had this passion for microsurgery and, and that's why I had this idea that, that eye surgery was something quite special that I could actually cure blindness and because the leading cause of blindness in the world is cataract and it forms the vast majority of blindness in the world and particularly in, sorry, in, in developing countries. Uh, it's half of world blindness but in developing countries it's the vast majority of blindness. So being able to cure blindness with a, with a surgery which is um, very sophisticated and yet you know, incredibly positive results just was so appealing to me. So I went from a prevention model to, to a, being able to um, you know, cure, uh, cure patients. That was a real driving factor for me. And it wasn't until several years later when I had these experiences in Asia and seeing young children who are blind through completely avoidable diseases such as measles or a lack of spectacle that I then returned to this idea that prevention is, is so critical in our lives and, and, and certainly we see many examples of that here in Australia as well. Mm-hmm. Can I just ask you what actually is the cause of cataracts? Is there, I mean, is it preventable at all or is that just something that happens? Sorry, excuse my intri- ignorance. Sure. There are many, many causes of cataracts, but, okay. but the majority, the vast, a majority of causes is what we call senile cataract. So everyone, if they live long enough, everyone will develop cataract. So there are a number of other causes, uh, trauma, for example, uh, chronic uh, prednisone or steroid use can cause cataract, chronic inflammation in the eyes, etc. But really the majority is just simply senile cataract or, or due to aging. Diabetes also uh, increases uh, cataract formation as well. Um, so what was interesting, actually, I'll go back to 2005, and again, another study in Myanmar, was at this time it was an adult line of study in a regional area of the country. And uh, I was in my early 40s, and we were uh, examining people from the age of 40 up. And I was seeing people who were younger than me at the age of 40 who were severely visually impaired or blind from cataract. This was something that I absolutely did not see here. Uh, in Australia. So this was another really powerful moment in my life to see young people who are blind from cataracts. Um, Why was this happening? And uh, uh, I have a a number of theories as to why we were seeing cataracts developing so early in in younger people. And uh, one of these was simply chronic dehydration. This was a regional area. It was a very hot and dry area. Um, People were subsistence farmers. They were really working hard in the fields and probably not replenishing their fluids. And I suspect that dehydration may actually play a role in formation in cataract in, in these populations. So um, that was a really, really powerful moment. We were, there were a small number of uh, the people who uh, had actually had cataract surgery, but many of them remained blind because the cataract surgery was a poor quality. And so this was another powerful moment that allowed myself and my colleagues at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and the Department of Ophthalmology to set up a program which was then funded by AusAid uh, in Australia to um, to really increase the quality of the uh, equipment so that they could undertake cataract surgery at a high level and in turn this uh, allowed them to uh, reach more people with the surgery that they were providing and we've seen really since that time uh, that project finished in about 2013 I think uh, we've seen a, a massive increase in the number of cataract surgeries performed every year in those regional eye centres in Myanmar. That was just one of the elements of the work that we were doing at the time. Mm, Fantastic, fantastic. So can I ask you now about, uh, you touched on type 2 diabetes as being one of the potential causes of cataracts, but um, you've been definitely been vocal this year around the debilitating consequences of type 2 diabetes. So why is that? Uh, the debilitating consequences of type 2 diabetes. Well, if we look at Australia, uh, well, let's, let's say let's look at the world as a whole. In the last 40 years, we've seen a fourfold explosion in type 2 diabetes worldwide. And this has actually been even more profound in some communities and countries. In China, for example, there's been a more than tenfold increase in type 2 diabetes in that time period. In Aboriginal communities here in Australia, about an 80-fold increase in type 2 diabetes over the Eight zero, yeah, yeah, which is, and then we now think type two diabetes in, in kids. Uh, 
In Australia, we're seeing them in, in kids as young as seven. Uh, it, there's even a famous case of a three-year-old child with type 2 diabetes in the States. So, you know, this is something that, that is quite extraordinary. Back in the 60s, type 2 diabetes was virtually unheard of. Uh, we're now seeing around about 250 cases of type 2 diabetes every single day in Australia. So there's about 1.7 million Australians with type 2 diabetes, and there's about 2 million with pre-diabetes. So um, uh, this is really diabetes waiting to happen. And there are some uh, areas of Australia, some poorer socio-economic areas particularly, such as Greater Western Sydney, where half of the adults have type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes for the first time in history, a nutritional disease is, and a preventable disease. So this is quite extraordinary and I think it's driven by uh, our modern diet, which is high in sugar, refined carbohydrates, which to me are sugar in disguise, and also uh, uh, highly processed foods is, is driving this. Yeah, yeah. I've talked to um, Belinda Fecky before, um, Dr. Gary Fecky's wife. You know, she's a, a, been such a campaigner for people understanding all this stuff. And she was saying to me, you know, that Gary used to see, you know, used to do amputations, you know, very rarely, you know, early on in his career. And it got to the point where he was doing two or three a week. You know, I think the consequences, people don't really understand. It's kind of a, uh, you know, I can just take some medication or, you know, and I'll be, I'll be right. I don't really think people do understand it because it is a slow and progressive disease. Talk, talk to us and, and help educate people a little bit on that. Sure. It's, it's a slow disease. And as you say, it's progressive or it can be progressive, but equally it's also reversible. It's preventable, but it's also reversible. So it doesn't have to be a, a slow, chronic, progressive disease, uh, which ultimately ends in severe debility and death, because you know it is it's certainly in the early stages, potentially uh, a reversible disease. How myself as an ophthalmologist, as an eye specialist became interested and involved in it, uh, well, like Gary Fetke, an orthopedic surgeon removing people's feet, uh, due to gangrene from their type 2 diabetes, I was seeing people who were losing vision, even going blind due to this insidious disease. So 90% of all diabetes is type 2 diabetes. And the blinding complications we see in people with all types of diabetes. And uh, so I was seeing every year more and more patients uh, who, were, who were losing vision. And, and I was uh, noticing that the treatments that I was needing to give to patients was also rising. And in fact, one of the treatments that I give is uh, an injection into the eye of a, an antibody, which helps seal up blood vessels at the central vision area, which are leaking fluid into the central vision area, causing blurring and distortion of vision. And, and just recently I received the, the stats from Medicare uh, we now, and the chart shows a progressive increase in the number of injections given Australia-wide. And last year, by the end of last year, there were over 90,000 injections given uh, to try and curb vision loss from diabetes. I suspect this year we're going to be up over 100,000. This is 100,000 injections every single year in Australia for a disease which in itself is preventable. So it makes me upset, it makes me angry. But I think one of the turning points for me was in 2018 when I, I met a, a man whose story had a seriously powerful impact on me. He uh, had neglected his type two diabetes. Uh, he went to bed one evening at the age of 50 and, and woke up the next morning blind in both eyes and he remains blind to this day. Uh, the poor man has also now had nine amputations uh, for gangrene of his left lower leg due to his diabetes. He's also had a heart attack. So there are a myriad of complications, life-changing and life-threatening complications due to type 2 diabetes. Blindness is the most feared. Second is, is amputation from gangrene, but it also causes impotence. It causes uh, numbness, tingling, pain in the hands and feet. It causes kidney failure. And people who have kidney failure need to, to have their blood filtered by dialysis, sometimes as much as seven hours a day, four days a week. And, and I've also calculated that in Australia every year, something like 60,000 hours are spent by patients with type 2 diabetes having their blood filtered by dialysis. 60,000 hours, this is not a great way to lead your life. It's hours which are, um, are lost to family and friends uh, to 
your work and into the things that you love to do. So, you know, devastating statistics. But it also causes life-threatening diseases such as um, heart attack and stroke I mentioned before. So the top three causes of death in our society are heart attack, dementia and stroke. And all three of these, diabetes is central uh, to, to the process. And I suspect if we actually looked at it more closely, uh, type 2 diabetes would, would be the leading cause of, of death and disability in our society these days. Also phenomenally expensive, costing our health system uh, probably in the order of $20 billion every single year in terms of treatment of diabetes and its complications and lost productivity in the workforce. So it's a, it's a high impact disease. Yeah, it sure is. And as you say, um, it's preventable and, mm -hmm. you know, can reversible, you know, if, if you, if you change your lifestyle, you know, early on, you know, I've seen that happen as well. And, you know, I work, um, I study at the Nutrition Network with Professor Tim Noakes. And I mean, he's a fine example of someone who was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and is put it into remission through lifestyle. So why is the conversation, I mean, you're trying to change the conversation, I know, but so many um, in the prof medical profession are not interested in the fact that this is preventable. You know, they it's it's about medication. It's about managing the 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 uh, symptoms as opposed to going um, and really looking at reversing the the disease. So, what are we up against here? Because it's just I hear it virtually every day. I hear stories of um, people that I know who go to the doctor and say, "I'm changing my lifestyle. I'm cutting out the you know sugars and the the carbohydrates and and it's like well no why are you doing that for you shouldn't be having saturated fat you know you need to be having oats for breakfast you know all this this misinformation that still be, is perpetuated out there and then of course you should be taking these tablets and you know if you don't take these tablets well what's wrong with you why are you not taking them there's just such a um i don't know we've got such a long way to go in terms of educating people out there so so <laughs> What can we do? You know, I know you're doing so much, but how else, what else can we do to help? Uh, yes, so there's, there's uh, it's a big conversation in itself. And, uh, you know, if we look at, there's a study that, that came out recently in 2017 that showed that over, over half, I think something like 56% of patients with type two diabetes were able to reverse their type two diabetes in a 10 week period with simply a low carb, low sugar diet. So we know that, that um, adopting such a diet is, is actually uh, critical in this whole process. I think also including periods of fasting is very important as well. And of course, exercise is, is an important part of, of lifestyle, but I think really diet is the critical thing here. And if we go back to a little bit of history, uh, you know, in the decades after World War II, it was noted that there was an increase in, in heart disease and heart attacks. And it was presumed that this was due to a fatty diet causing fatty blockage of the coronary arteries. And this was based on no real science and no strong evidence whatsoever. And so what happened, and there's, there's still a lot of, lot of history and, and um, misinformation leading up to this point, but in 1980, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans was released. And this guideline recommended reducing our fat to 30% and upping our carbs to 60%. Mm. And rather than seeing a downturn in the heart disease, the cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease actually soared and, and along with the type two diabetes, which I mentioned since that time, we then saw that fourfold increase in type two diabetes. So there's a lot going on here. There's uh, a lot of vested interests. There's religious ideology, there's industry um, uh, interests, and, and it's a real quagmire, which is very, very difficult. Um, and there's also, I think, another a number of other factors, which I've dubbed the five A's of, of sugar toxicity. And, and uh, it, it was a way of me getting my head around this whole space. And just to go through those briefly, so the first A is, uh, Addiction, so sugar is highly addictive. It's been shown to be as addictive as nicotine. So if consumption activates a reward center in our brain, leading to the release of the neurotransmitter um, dopamine, which is the feel-good chemical, which makes us feel good when we have sugary treats. Uh, second A is alleviation. We often use sugar to alleviate stress or to make us feel better when we're down. Um, it counters the 
release of the stress hormone cortisol when we're anxious. So the third A is accessibility. Sugar is cheap and quite literally everywhere in our lives. You can't walk into most service stations without encountering a wall of confectionery. And you certainly can't check out from most supermarkets and stores without being enticed by um, mm. half price uh, uh, soft drinks and, and confectionery and chocolates. The fourth A is addition. Uh, an astronomical amount of, of uh, sugar is added to our food and drink, something in the order of 75%. And the fifth A is advertising. You know, our world again is flooded with ads and TV commercials for, for sugary products. So these things which make um, sugar such a difficult thing to kick. And if we look at those, uh, those five A's in their entirety, well, let's look at the first two A's. It's about personal awareness, being aware that sugar is highly addictive and that we're using it to alleviate stress. I think if people were aware of that, and me as a doctor wasn't aware of that until quite recently, then you can then start to curb the addictive uh, pull of sugar and, and uh, uh, related products. And then the other three A's, uh, accessibility, addition and advertising, is really about accountability of, of businesses, industry and government to do the right thing by the people of Australia. And again, there are a number of strategies that we can look at that uh, we can help to, um, to, to turn that around. Mm, mm, I love that. I love those A's. Um, my concern is that I guess the reach of the pharmaceutical industry, um, certainly a lot of the low carb GPs that I know, you know, will speak very openly about the fact that their colleagues are just not interested um, in doing what they're doing. And they're still almost, a, um, you know, they're standalone, a lot of them. Um, and I definitely know it's growing. I mean, there's definitely a groundswell of, of change. But you know, I was reading a book uh, the other day called um, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, and it looks at the cognitive dissonance, I guess, that we sort of go through when uh, we come across information that doesn't match our beliefs. And they talk about the pharmaceutical industry in terms of their reach um, and the gifts, the little gifts that they give doctors and things like that, which, you know, uh, does play a part in whether they're, you know, going to prescribe that medication or not. So, you know, that to me is a really big thing that, you know, we need to look at sort of changing in some ways because I, I can't see how they, uh, most doctors will be interested in, in not prescribing medication and looking down the lifestyle path, which doesn't, doesn't make pharmacology rich. I mean, that's about getting people off medication. Mm, that's right. Oh, again, it's, it's, a, it's a quite a... Um... Uh, a detailed area we can examine in more detail. So there's no biochemical process in the body that demands that we must ingest carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are nutritionally deficient and they um, we don't need to, to ingest them. They're not essential to our survival, our health. Whereas fats and proteins are essential. We, we can't survive without them. And in fact, we can generate all the glucose that we need for the energy in our bodies simply by, by uh, fats and proteins. So to have a, a dietary guideline and a dietary dogma, which is recommending that we have a diet that's high in cereals and grains, which are high in carbohydrates, particularly refined carbohydrates, is exactly the diet that is driving this epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And it's, it is extraordinary to think that doctors are still not aware of this. And I suspect um, this has simply uh, been a campaign of misinformation, but there's also probably, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's when I mean, you've had decades of an understanding that, that saturated fats in our diet are bad for our health, when we've had an understanding that you know, breakfast is such an important uh, meal of the day. When this is in our minds, it's actually very hard as as doctors to to um, uh, to actually turn that around. You know, this is we're talking decades, and similar to smoking, it, it took a long, long time for this uh, to be reversed. And there were such campaigns of misinformation that happened at the time. So, you know, it's really important for doctors, for my colleagues, to be aware of the evidence which has been around for a long, long time now. And, and certainly uh, in June this year, there was another really important uh, meta-analysis, a very high level review study that showed that natural saturated fats in our diet have never been shown to cause cardiovascular disease. Mm. 
So it's seriously important for people to know that. It needs to be shouted from the rooftops. Um, and these are, these are uh, uh, foods such as uh, unprocessed meat, and, and particularly red meat, uh, dark chocolate, eggs, um, full-fat dairy, all the products for the last 40 years that have been demonized. We need mm. to be aware that these products are actually critical to our health. And, and so I think it's really time now for, for people to, to take this on board. Uh, we, and that's why I'm speaking about it so much. I've been hoping to speak at a number of medical conferences this year. This year. In fact, I was speaking at the Australian Medical Association conference, the major GP conference, um, and both of those conferences were cancelled and they've gone online. Um, but unfortunately, my role in those conferences has been dropped because uh, they're all about COVID-19. So a really disappointing opportunity, um, sorry, a, a really excellent opportunity, which has disappointingly uh, been, been dropped now for me. So I'll keep on speaking about it because I think it's, uh, it's, it's so critical to uh, our health as a nation. I think we have the opportunity to turn it around here. And in fact, I've, I've recently written a number of times to the NH and MRC and to the Department of Health outlining the flaws uh, and the conflicts of interest, the bias which is inherent in our dietary guidelines. And I was delighted to hear a couple of weeks ago that Greg Hunt has announced that they're going to be reviewing the dietary guidelines. I think it's, it's really time uh, for this to, uh, to be happening. Absolutely, it is. And I do want to ask you about the dietary guidelines, but just something that you touched on then that, you know, saying that you were dropped because of COVID being the, the main focus at the moment. And, and isn't it interesting because we know that people with type 2 diabetes are most likely to get COVID. I mean, it's, it's people who are metabolically unhealthy that are more likely to pick this up. So it could not be more relevant to have a discussion now about diet and what people are eating. It is the perfect time and uh, I sense that this is happening. And if you look at the first three months of the COVID-19 pandemic, there are 102 deaths from the virus, which is of course tragic. But at the same time, we had over 5,000 deaths in Australia from type two diabetes, 5,000 deaths which went unrecognized essentially and, and certainly unheralded. So it's, it's uh, just, critical information that, that we need uh, to then be aware of going forward. And I know during the lockdown, and, and I'm so sorry to hear of the lockdown that's happened in Melbourne and, and perhaps South Australia is, is not far behind, but uh, during a lockdown period, of course, people are, are stressed about a, many number of things and particularly about their opportunity to work and earn a living and, and provide for themselves and their families. So during stressful times, people often turn to sugar and, and excessive eating of refined carbohydrates. And so we know that, you know, in those early weeks of the, um, the first wave, the things that went flying off the shelves weren't just toilet paper, they were the refined carbohydrates, so the passes, the white flour, the white rice, all missing and, and, and have barely been restocked to this day. So I have no doubt that, that people will be turning towards these uh, refined carbohydrates, sugary treats, I mean, all the soft drinks went as well. So I suspect what we will see, it hasn't been, it hasn't happened at this point in time because I suspect uh, most people haven't gone to see their doctor. So the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes hasn't, hasn't increased over the past few months, but I suspect there will be a, um, a tail and that eventually we'll see that there'll be a, a rise in type 2 diabetes during this time because of the unhealthy diet, the lack of exercise, also the, um, uh, the, uh, the fast food and takeaway that I'm sure people are eating during these times. And uh, it, it frightens me um, that, that we'll see a burst in type 2 diabetes. I'm certainly now, you know, after that first wave and the lockdown east and south Australia, I noticed that we were seeing uh, more patients coming who'd put their appointments off. And so as an eye specialist, I was seeing people who are seriously putting their eyesight at risk. And, and I have had a number of patients already who have lost irreversibly, sorry, irreversibly uh, vision uh, from diabetes, from macular degeneration and other uh, vision threatening conditions because they delay their appointments because they're worried about going to the doctor. So uh, despite our reassurances as a practice that we were doing everything to keep them safe, they were still not coming. Even yesterday in my, in my practice, I had patients who were cancelling appointments because they were worried. And so uh, this is really important for patients not to neglect their health during these times, not to neglect their appointments, particularly if they have things like type 2 diabetes or if they have vision threatening diseases. It's, it's really critical for them to maintain their appointments so that they um, don't put themselves in a worse 
health situation. So, yeah, this is a, a trying time, uh, uh, not just because of the, the risks and the complications of the virus, but also the, uh, the other health issues that surround it and, and as well as the economic issues that, that are uh, playing out at the moment. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So in talking about their dietary guidelines, so you've definitely uh, been instrumental in getting them reviewed, which is absolutely fantastic. So um, a couple of things I want to ask you about that is, is, well, firstly, what would you like them to change? What would you like them to look like? So what are, what are the changes that you are pushing for in terms of review? Um, and also what's your I guess who are the stakeholders? So who are going to be involved in that process if you know that at this stage? Sure. So the last time the dietary, the Australian Dietary Guidelines was reviewed was in 2013. Well, sorry, that's when they were released. I think they started the review process in 2009. And if you actually look uh, at the Australian Guide for Healthy Eating, which is the pictorial representation, two thirds of the um, foodstuffs are plant-based and the cereal and grain section is enormous but if you actually look more closely at the references and let's say the references to the cereal and grain section there were 73 references that were used to to draw up um, the current set of guidelines and all but 10 of those were industry funded so that in itself immediately puts bias into this whole process there's also a handbook of questions which guide the literature review, which I understand the Dietary Association of Australia played a big role in. But there's significant bias with this, within this as well. And if you look at uh, the questions, uh, there is significant bias within the questions. And if you look at the meat section, the questions actually bias the search to find a link between the consumption of red meat and cancer. In the cereal section, there's one question that biases the search to look for the health benefits of cereals and grains. And so there was no balance here. You didn't have a question that said, let's look at the risks and benefits of red meat and the risks and benefits of cereals. They actually bias, so it's a strategic deception, biasing the literature search. So there's serious bias within this whole process. And there are key members of that working group that also had uh, contacts and, and connections to industry at the time. So although the, 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 uh, the NHMRC who oversaw this um, suggests that that bias was managed, you know, how can that bias be, uh, be ignored really? Um, also, if you look back at the 2003 guidelines um, where it was recommended that we reduce the saturated fat in our diet, when the 2013 guidelines came to be reviewed, it was recommended that that evidence hasn't changed and that, that recommendation to reduce the natural saturated fats on our diet still be maintained. So there was no opportunity for the natural saturated fats, which are so critical to our health, uh, to actually be revised in the, in the current set of guidelines. So I think that this is, is critical going forward that uh, this uh, be reinstated as a, as a really important part of our health. Mm. So we sort of have a history in following what the US do with um, things like dietary guidelines and um, I'm sure you're aware that they just had a big review of theirs um, and there was a big group um, led by Nina Tarschultz, the Nutrition Coalition, that was pushing for all the evidence to be put on the table and unfortunately it's been largely ignored and the diet, the reviews come in and it's even more bias. Um, it's got even less red meat in it and more plant-based in it. So, you know, devastating really for them. Um, do you hold hope that we might be able to stand alone a little bit and not follow in their shoes when it comes to the review we're about to undertake? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's critical that we don't follow those guidelines. Um, there was a four person subcommittee on those guidelines who had significant personal and ideological bias. The process lacked transparency, it excluded a large number of rigorous studies, um, it relied primarily on weak data for its conclusions, and, and almost all the committee members had a long list of conflicts of industry with um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, food industry, supplementary companies. So, you know, this, how can it not influence their decision making? So it's really um, critical that we don't make the same mistake, that we don't go down the same bias pathway uh, with the review of, of our dietary guidelines. And I will we'll be writing to the NHMRC and the Department of Health 
uh, recommending that uh, we look very critically at who was involved in drawing up our last set of guidelines and omitting uh, them from the process because we don't want that same bias, those same conflicts of industry, the same ideological and industry bias to creep into uh, what is going to be informing uh, nationwide nutritional health policy. Yeah, absolutely. So what can we do? You know, what can we do as individuals to help in that process? Is there anything that we can do? Can we write to, you know, our politicians or is it more just waiting for the process to start before we can get involved or? Yeah, I understand. I think uh, writing and, and people talking about this and, and uh, I've had a number of uh, media opportunities, which is fantastic in my role as Australian of the Year this year. I'm fortunate in that people uh, are open to, to listening at, to what I'm saying and I will continue to write and to continue to uh, seek media opportunities to talk about this. So I think this is a great opportunity uh, for us to turn around our chronic ill health, which is, is driven by our poor nutrition. Really, really good opportunity. So I think having the public also being aware and also writing to, to their local members, to their politicians, um, and, 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 and just keeping this in the spotlight, I think is very, very important. When uh, the next review of the guidelines will be released, I think it, I understand it will go out to, to public uh, scrutiny. So hopefully uh, we will get people looking at the guidelines and scrutinizing to see whether there's any bias in, in the references, whether there is there any industry or, or um, religious bias within the uh, references, the literature which guide uh, the review process and guide the next uh, edition of the guidelines. So you know, hopefully we do have significant interest from, from the public so that that can be scrutinized and we can ensure uh, that we don't have any um, uh, uh, conflicts going forward. Yeah, fantastic. So you said that you have, <clears throat> excuse me, been overwhelmingly listened to and, and people are receiving what you're saying. Has that been the case? Have you, or have you um, had any sort of negative uh, kickback or pressure to maybe not speak out as much as you are? Yeah, in fact, uh, after the Australia Day weekend, I got back to work on the Tuesday morning and there was an email waiting for me, a, a troll email. And I've had uh, a number of troll emails uh, condemning what I'm saying. And, and of course, there's every chance that they're coming from the sugar industry. There are a lot of industries that don't want to hear this. There's the sugar industry, there's the uh, processed food industry. Um, uh, of course, you know, there, there's going to be, a, and, and the, the beverages uh, industry as, as well that, that don't want to hear these messages. But this is where I, I'm calling on accountability. Um, these businesses, these industries are driving uh, this terrible epidemic of poor health in favor of profits. And so I think really they need to be held to account and, and this is the time to, uh, to, to do it and to be able to change around. And we'll see, we need resilience and we need innovation. We need innovation in businesses and industry. You know, we saw it with the tobacco industry. Uh, if we look back, you know, there was an uproar uh, in, in, in Australia in decades past when the tobacco industry was potentially impacted. But I understand that the tobacco farmers were able to, uh, uh, you know, once they actually um, uh, were no longer allowed to, to farm tobacco, they then went into farming avocados and mangoes and things like that and actually making more money. And so potentially, you know, the sugarcane farmers, they can use the sugarcane for, um, you know, clean fuel and ethanol, That's or right, they can, yeah. there, there's other things they can do. You know, it's actually been modeled in, in a number of countries where there's been a levy on, on sugary uh, drinks that there's been no impact on jobs. And so with the fact that 80% of our sugar is actually exported, <coughs> excuse me, it's been, it's been modeled that there's gonna be very little, little impact, <laughs> excuse me, very little impact on, on jobs in, in Australian uh, sugarcane farming sector. So you are a fan of um, pushing for a sugar tax? Yes, yeah, so I called uh, in that, uh, well, at the um, award ceremony, actually I made a speech and uh, then had a, a lot of media attention. And, and in those days afterwards, it was all about Dr. Muki calls for a sugar tax. But I was actually calling for a, a, a multi-pronged strategy, not just a sugar tax. Sugar tax is one of a number of things. And if we go back to those, those uh, five A's of sugar toxicity, and particularly the three A's of sugar toxicity, uh, sugar toxicity, accessibility, you know, what I've been calling for is to move sugary products away from checkout counters and stores and supermarkets. Um, with addition, we need a clear and transparent uh, 
labeling system so that we know how much added sugar is, is in our food and drinks. And it's the addition a, where the tax or levy comes into it. But there's certainly some good, strong evidence and solid reasoning behind it. We know that um, uh, in Australia in the decade leading up to 2017, there was a 30% increase in consumption of sugary drinks. We know from many studies that sugary drinks have been linked to type 2 diabetes. And we know also from about 17 studies worldwide that a levy or a tax on sugary drinks has resulted in a reduction in, in uh, purchase and consumption. So it makes sense to me. And so in Australia, it's been modelled that if we have a 20% levy on sugary drinks, this will raise over $600 million. And that can be used to drive health awareness initiatives that I mentioned before, to raise awareness of the multitude of health dangers of sugar, not just obesity and type 2 diabetes, but also tooth decay. This is the leading cause of dental caries in our society. And the money can also be used to fund health inequalities. You know, if you go up to Aboriginal communities, you'll see that um, sugary food and drinks are in abundance and actually cheap, and health and healthy and fresh foods are expensive. And the final a, advertising, one of the other things I've been calling for is a um, uh, to uh, to take ads for sugary food and drinks from the TV during those hours that our children are watching. So a levy or a tax on sugary drinks is just one of many strategies, and, and there are a number of other strategies. We should be looking at our school canteens to see what they're selling. We can remove ads uh, from, from the internet. They're targeting our kids. So it's really, you know, people often say, oh, a, this is all nannying, but actually raising awareness is not nannying. And when we're protecting our children who are now developing type 2 diabetes, when we're protecting the vulnerable in our society, you know, this in no way can be considered nanning. And public health initiatives are absolutely critical. And if you look at all of the public health initiatives that have happened in recent years, you know, for example, seatbelts have saved lives, um, helmets, riding motorbikes have saved lives, uh, banning cigarette smoking from, you know, rent restaurant restaurants and pubs will help to save lives. I mean, there's so many examples of this that I, I would suggest no one these days would consider as nannying. So when you have um, a, uh, an epidemic of type 2 diabetes, which is now impacting in some regions of Australia, well over 10% of the popula population, then you know, it's really time to, to do something positive and it's really time for the government to be accountable and do something positive to curb this uh, serious threat to our health system and to our society. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. And it's interesting talking about, um, you know, the, the sugary businesses that rely heavily on that. You know, one of the um, one of the things I've heard a lot about and you've talked about is the Exercise is Medicine campaign by Coca-Cola. So a lot of those companies are really vested in the everything in moderation and then, the, you know, is still holding on to the eat less, move more. Well, you're overweight because you just don't exercise. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that you know, because we know it, I mean, we know exercise in the scheme of health is important, but they they slur it. So they make people, it makes it really hard for people to understand the true cause of all this sort of stuff. So that, you know, that to me is, it's not, it's that's underhanded. It's not up front. So it does definitely make it harder for people to see through all that stuff. Exactly. And if you look at the exercises medicine movement, one of the founding partners was Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola's vested interest and is move more so you can drink more Coke. And even I, I uh, wrote an opinion piece for the Canberra Times and uh, about a month ago, actually. And a few days later, Dick Telford, who is one of the founders of the Australian Institute of Sport, came out saying that uh, uh, we, we, don't, we can't forget uh, exercise is an important part of this process. But if you then look at Dick Telford's research, he's had a long studying sorry, a long-standing study that's been funded by Coca-Cola. So, you know, Dick Telford's conflict of interest here is that he's been funded by Coke. So he will be advocating for people to move more so that they can drink more soft drink, drink more Coca-Cola. So you have to really look at these conflicts of interest before we um, seriously place uh, too much emphasis on, on these opinions. Mm, absolutely, we do. I was hoping Particularly I could when read... Not. Oh, particularly sorry. when they're not based on particularly when they're not based on rigorous science yeah absolutely absolutely i was hoping i could read quickly just a message i got sent yesterday from um one of my instagram followers i um 
because I, I want to ask you to um, explain a little bit about why weight ne isn't necessarily an indicator of health because and you touched on in the beginning, you said something about um, refined carbohydrates are sugar in disguise, you know, so I think there's a real misunderstanding out there. Yes, I think no one can really deny the effects of sugar. But when you talk about carbohydrates and refined carbohydrates, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding there, you know, well, people don't really understand that they do convert to sugar in the blood and it's the same, you know, whether it's a can of Coke or a bowl of rice, there is a blood sugar. Um, response. But I wanted to read you this because um, I posted a, a picture that said, you know, we believe that patients get type 2 diabetes because they're overweight. And it's a doctor, Dr. Brian Lensk Lensk Lenkis, I think his name is, um, was talking about how, a, you know, he has a huge number of patients who are, un, you know, in a nice lean weight, yet they're type 2 diabetic. Um, and this message I got was from this lady. She said, this is my dad. He weighs under 70 kilos. He is 74 years old and has run 80 marathons, ultra marathons, and now cycles 100 kilometers a week. He has type 2 diabetes and is on statins from two heart attacks and won't give up the carbs because my mum doesn't believe it's healthy. So that, uh, you know, that says so much to me. And I, that's not an uncommon story, is it? No, that's right. It's not an uncommon story. And uh, you mentioned about refined carbohydrates and particularly the refined carbohydrates. Uh, you know, white rice, for example, is highly processed. It's had the husk, the grain, the, the wheat germ removed, from, sorry, the germ removed from it. So all you're left with is, is basically a little bullet of pure starch. And starch is simply a long chain of glucose. When it reaches the gut, it's broken down into single molecules of glucose, which are then absorbed into the bloodstream. So pretty much when you're having refined carbohydrates, such as the foods made from white rice, white flour, so breads and pasta, uh, white potatoes, you're pretty much having uh, a sugary treat. And in, interestingly, I looked at a, a packet of pasta the other day and it had 3.5% uh, sugar. And I thought, oh, that's not too bad. But then the refined carbohydrate element was 67%. So this is nearly 70% sugar when you're having a packet of pasta. So it's really important for people to be aware of this. And, and I know your, your experience in that, that uh, person that made a comment. Um, I've had an exactly the similar conversation with a number of my patients. And one of them I can remember quite clearly, it was quite recently, and, and he said, Doc, and I'm doing everything. I've cut out all the sugar. I've even cut out all the refined carbohydrates. Uh, I'm not having soft drinks, et cetera, et cetera. We had this long conversation. I thought, oh, well, you know, you know, he's doing all the right things. And I suspect that there's, you know, there is a genetic element here in some people. And as he was leaving, he said, oh, doc, when I come next time, can I bring you a packet of dried fruit? My, my wife and I package dried fruit as a living. So bingo, there you go. There, there is the little sugar bullet in the, in the dried fruit, which are heavy, heavily sugary treats. And if I look back, um, I mentioned earlier that that uh, man that I know, um, he's not a patient actually, but I was filming a documentary in 2018 about uh, the experience of blindness. So I was seeking people who were blind and, and what their experience was. And, and uh, Neil Hansel, his name, he doesn't mind me using his name. He was actually on the stage at the Australia Day ceremony. He was the guy that went to bed at the age of 50 and woke up blind the next morning. Mm -hmm. At the age of 16, when he first started earning money, through to the age of 26, when he developed type two diabetes, he drank four liters of Coca-Cola every single day. Four liters of Coke. And if you actually calculate that out, and, and don't quote me on this, but I think a two liter bottle has got about 52 grams of sugar. So a four liter bottle has got about 104 grams of sugar. And half of that is fructose. And fructose is the really dangerous component because, um, well, for a number of reasons, it's not recognized as a food stuff by the body. It doesn't trigger the release of insulin. It's not, um, it's uh, actually suppresses our appetite control. And when it hits the liver, 30% uh, of it is converted immediately to, to fat, which is, is then harmful and helps develop a fatty liver, which is central to this whole process. So 30% of let's say the 52 grams of sugar is direct, converted directly to fat. So whatever a third of the 52 grams is, uh, is turned into fat every time you have a four litre bottle of Coke. So this poor guy, he was on the move, he exercised, he was thin, and yet he didn't realise at the time 
the danger. He wasn't aware of how danger, dangerous what he was doing was to his body. And even when he developed type 2 diabetes at the age of 26, he didn't realize the myriad of life-changing and life-threatening complications. Now, this is a disease, an insidious disease that ravages the entire body. He had no idea that what he was doing was putting himself at serious risk of, of damage to his own body and, and to, to serious damage to, to his family. I mean, when someone has type 2 diabetes, it's not just themselves. They take along uh, their partner and other family members for the ride. So, um, you know, he's, he's a very strong advocate for this as well because he is aware now, he wasn't aware back then, he wasn't aware that uh, that how addicted that sugar was and that he was actually addicted. He realizes now, but he wasn't aware then that he was addicted. So again, this is where the conversations need to be. Addiction, alleviation, um, the, the dangers of all the added sugar, the, the, the factor that causes type 2 diabetes, not always uh, associated with obesity. Obesity actually is, is the biggest risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Um, let's say 20 to 35 kilogram gain in weight is associated with something like a 11,000 sorry, 11,600 percent increase in type 2 diabetes. So this is a, a serious driver of type 2 diabetes, but you don't always have to be overweight. So um, just the fact that you might be keeping a healthy um, uh, healthy weight doesn't mean you're, you're not at risk. And certainly for me, you know, in earlier in this year, uh, I was a big fan. I, you know, it was rarely a day where I haven't had ice cream after dinner and, and at work most days I would pretty much consume a pack of cream biscuits. I had a scan of my liver earlier in the year and, and I had had a fatty liver. So little did I realize that I was on the way uh, to potentially type 2 diabetes. So I immediately went into a, a sugar detox. I, I Every day or most days I have a time restricted eating or fasting. So from dinner right through to lunch the next day. I always exercise a lot. I'm not overweight. I had a little bit of a belly, but certainly I didn't feel like I was at risk at all. Uh, and actually on Thursday, I'm going to have my follow-up scan to see if I've managed to reverse my uh, fatty liver. I've certainly dropped probably about 10 kilograms. Uh, everyone who'd seen me uh, for the lockdown said, my goodness, how much weight that you've lost. So yeah, these, these, um, these are really, really critical uh, for people to be aware of the dangers of not just sugar, um, but also the amount of added sugar, the refined carbohydrates, all of these things which are potentially doing us damage. Mm. And that we can't necessarily outrun it or exercise it off. I think that's, you know, really important for people to understand. I mean, I was a personal trainer for 12 years and I've been definitely guilty of telling people to carb load and, you know, restrict their fat and yeah, all that stuff that I now know is not correct and I'm doing my utmost to make up for, for that. But, you know, so many people are still told by their doctor to just, you know, it's your fault, you're gluttonous, you're just eating too much, just go and stop eating less and go and move more. And I just think mm. it is absolutely cruel to tell um, someone to, to do that and not Partic help them. <laughs> exactly. And, and particularly also when... Uh, when um, uh, when sugar is so addictive and, and that mm -hmm. people are not aware of it. And mm -hmm. for me, you know, the, the, my need for sugar was, was a physical dependency. So literally day one, when I went into my sugar toxicity, I um, had withdrawal symptoms of headache, um, irritability, uh, cloud of thoughts and, and fatigue. And for me, it was really tough. And it was actually much tougher than the, the a coffee withdrawal. And I also experienced these cravings. And for three days, I was, you know, it was it was so intense. Yeah. But after day three, I then started to to come out of that. But, you know, quite simply, when, when people are having that um, that withdrawal, that mini withdrawal, uh, and, and that need for a sugar hit, that's, that's really just your addiction talking to you. But I suspect yeah. there's also many, many people, and particularly poorer parts of our society, where they're using sugar uh, to alleviate significant stress in their lives, and the, and the, and the um, addiction may actually be a much deeper psychological element to it. And so, I think we also need to look, you know, going forward with with funding that hopefully would would derive from a levy on sugary drinks and other heavily sugar products. We could actually um, have in place uh, um, you know, health, health, sorry, support groups and and uh, helplines, and also counselling, psychological counselling, like we've done for alcohol and also for nicotine. So, 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think this is this is also very important uh, for people to be aware of. And 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 these weight loss, you know, the the fad diets have have got a, a ninety, ne nearly a hundred percent failure rate. They, they, they just don't work because when when we drop our calories, we actually drop our metabolism. Um, but the the really important thing is when we actually go into a fasting mode, you actually have significant metabolic changes. So when we when we fast, we have a sudden drop in insulin, and insulin is the big driver of weight loss. People who are on, on insulin realize that once they go on insulin, they actually increase their weight. So insulin uh, helps convert glucose into fat. So if we can get off insulin, uh, that's a really good thing. Also, when you fast, you have a, a rise in adrenaline and growth hormones. So when you fast, even for short periods, you have significant metabolic changes, which can actually drive weight loss and drive reversal of type 2 diabetes. So this is also a very important part of, of, the, of the puzzle. And uh, But if anyone's listening and they do have uh, type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes, if you're going to do, do any fasting, if you're on, particularly if you're on medications, you need to do it in conjunction with your treating GP or physician. Uh, so um, fasting is, is a very important part of it. And exercise is, is, is also very important as well. But exercise, um, you know, I think one of the, the biggest uh, health benefits of exercise is stimulating the reward center in our brain. And that also leads to the release of dopamine. Anyone who's been for a vigorous exercise, they feel great as a result of it. So this is really good. And particularly in these uh, times where we're in lockdown, that's why uh, despite the lockdown, we're still encouraged to get out and exercise because it makes us feel good. It makes us feel better. And it's actually a much better alternative than reaching for a two liter or four liter bottle of soft drink or reaching for you know, another uh, packet of cream biscuits or, or a block of chocolate and consuming the whole lot. You know, I think it's really important to see exercise in this respect, not use exercise so that you can uh, eat more sugary treats. Yes, that's right. And I think, you know, for, for people who are actually metabolically unhealthy, to tell them to go and exercise can be actually hard. You know, their body is under stress and it's struggling. You know, I've seen, this is what I see happen with my clients who are reversing their, their insulin resistance and things like that, you know, they feel so bad about themselves because they've got no energy. Okay. So that cycle. So I can't, I don't feel like exercising. My body's struggling to make enough energy to get me through the day, but I feel so bad. I know I should be doing it. But when they start to reverse things, you know, it's amazing how the energy <clears throat> just comes and they do then for the first time in their life, almost feel like moving and exercising. And it's, so wonderful to watch and you know talking what you were saying about the the physical and the psychological addiction of sugar and carbohydrates it's most of my work now you know i think the the physical addiction while it's painful for a few days is much easier than the ha the habits and and the psychological things and how we've linked you know uh, certain foods to feeling good and that is very very difficult um, to break and absolutely agree with you. That's an area that needs more attention and people need a lot more support uh, to do that. Um, and that's why, you know, I think most of my work is like that. I, I Now I have people, they know what low carb is. They're really, they understand the science. They know what to eat because um, it's not complicated. It's, it's really, you know, it's just eat real food. And, you know, when you understand what food does, it's quite an easy decision. But they're very, very tied to the habits that they have around food and what their family do and and that's the the stuff that def they definitely need more support around yeah it needs to be a systemic change doesn't it and mm -hmm. and uh, you know i mentioned to someone the other day that oh they didn't even realize that we had dietary guidelines and i said well that's true because mm -hmm. i actually didn't even realize we had dietary guidelines but what you do realize what we've been told for so long is that that meat's bad for us, meat causes cancer, saturated fats are bad for us, it causes heart attack, that, you know, that I mentioned before, that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. None of these things have any evidence behind them. So this is all steeped in, in, in um, you know, biased uh, opinion and, and uh, biased literature. So uh, really critical, really critical for people to be aware of this. And, and what you mentioned before about people who are overweight or obese, quite simply, you know, cutting out those heavily sugar products, being aware of the excess sugar in some of the foods that they're eating, and uh, and also in incorporating some fasting into their daily habit, um, and and then that will drive the weight loss, and then that will allow them then to start moving more freely. Uh, it'll take the pressure off their joints; they'll be able to 
uh, exercise more freely and, and go for long walks and go for more vigorous walks so they can then build up on that and it's so it's so so important um the one downside for me was uh in the last um three months i've lost so much weight none of my clothes fit anymore none of my, none of my trousers fit anymore but one of the other positive things actually is that my wife says i don't snore anymore so that's a really positive thing yeah. of, of weight loss and so you know, there's so many, so many uh, positive things that can come out of this, as well as uh, improving, uh, improving our health. And you know, there are there are a lot of strategies, and there are a lot of books and apps that people can actually access to, to, to look more closely at fasting and, and and what foods to avoid and what foods to be um, to be we should be eating. Um, but also, when you you got to be careful about when you have a habit that's tied to. Uh, enjoying a sugary treat. So let my, let's say my wife and I would often sit down after dinner and, and get a block of chocolate and, and watch uh, watch TV. So you know that was a habit. You know, often we go to the cinema and we have an ice cream or a, a big uh, container of, of soft drink. So if you actually start to look at those habits that are tied to a, um, a sugary treat, well, let's say if you go for a long run and you come back and have your sugary treat, if you just be very critical and, and very aware of not tying those habits to a sugary treat. That's one of very important mechanism to try and curb this uh, this uh, drive to consume sugary treats. Mm, absolutely, and it's absolutely possible to do that. I think it's very uncomfortable to to do that, but with awareness and time and, and support and, you know, I've seen it. I've seen people do, you know, they have disengaged from those habits and changed it. So um, absolutely possible. And I'm very, very grateful to you, Dr. James Mewki. I should definitely let you go. I've talked to you for so long. I'm hoping I could end on one question. I'd love to know um, from you is who are your heroes? Who is who is someone that has really inspired you to, to, to do what you're doing? Um, sure. Well, <clears throat> I can I can I can just very briefly talk about uh, a, a hero in my history and a hero at the moment. I believe uh, the hero uh, from my history was was the director of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, Colin Moore, uh, back in 1988 when I was doing my internship, and I was wanting to do surgery and certainly considering ophthalmology at the time. Um, but I was reaching out to a number of the surgical groups, and the advice I was getting almost universally was, oh, you know, if you leave the system, because I was, I was wanting to go to Africa. And I explained to them, I wanted to just have a year off, go to Africa and, and uh, have this experience. And everyone was saying, oh, if you leave the system, you'll never get back in, you'll ruin your chances of getting into specialty training. And I was hearing this time and time again, and I was getting a little bit despondent. But then I went and met uh, with Colin Moore, and I said, I'm interested in doing ophthalmology, but I want to go to Africa and have a year and have this experience. And he was really supportive. In fact, he said, if you do this, and uh, if you came back and you were there with someone else who was also going for the job, I would select you because you've broadened your horizon, you've gone out and done so something different. So that gave me the, the freedom to go and have that experience. And that, for me, was a life-changing experience, as I mentioned before, that really has been instrumental in the life that I've led and the incredibly rewarding and satisfying life that I've led. And, and uh, wow, you know, it's... Um, that piece of advice was was brilliant. So uh, I've always been very encouraging of people to to follow their passions, not trying to put people off doing something that they they, they really feel is an important uh, element of their life. So that was a great piece of advice that I got. So um, and and at the moment uh, there are a number of heroes across the country. Certainly there were a number of heroes during the bushfire uh, we saw quite visibly, um, and there are a number of heroes during the pandemic that uh, we're seeing at the moment. Um, but there are also many other, other heroes who are uncelebrated, whose who's amazing work really never never goes recognised, that never goes rewarded or celebrated, and, and um, I'm sure many people will know. But certainly uh, for me, someone who's been a hero to me at the moment is, is Nicola Spuria, who's the, is the um, Chief Preventative Health Officer uh, in South Australia with uh, Wellbeing SA. And uh, so she's been, um, been our leader guiding us through this pandemic uh, very visibly and, and really has put South Australia in a fantastic position. So I think uh, she certainly gets my vote as a, as a, a fantastic hero who's just been um, a rock during this uh, difficult time that we're going through. 
Well, fantastic. That's wonderful. I can't thank you enough for joining me today and thank you for all that you're doing. You have um, a huge amount of support behind you. And, you know, I know as soon as we know how we can help and the, what we can do, there'll be a lot of people that will be very vocal in, in pushing for fantastic change with the dietary guidelines. So please don't stop. Please keep going. And thank you so much for everything. It's a pleasure, Tracy, and thank you so much for reaching out to me and uh, really enjoyed the interview and uh, look forward to chatting some more. So thank you so much. Thank you.